Welcome back to the pod. I am currently in Bacalar, Mexico. My podcast now should be called Just Making Podcasts from a Bed with Unstable Wi Fi. <laughs> Um, I have a really special guest on the podcast this week. I've been waiting um, to speak to this person live on the pod since we started. Uh, someone I talk to almost every day, but someone that has not yet been on the podcast. So today's guest is my dear, dear friend, Ashley Brodeur. Ashley is a registered psychotherapist, yoga teacher and trainer, breathwork facilitator, Sagittarius, and the founder of The Philosophy, which is a supportive touch methodology for yoga teachers and health practitioners. Ashley also is my co-facilitator in our 200-hour yoga teacher training program and has been my dear friend and sister for over a decade, I think. We'll get into that, but welcome to the podcast, Ashley Brodeur. I'm so happy to be here and for you to have me. Finally. It's yeah, finally. <laughs> Just trying to make our schedules aligned. And um, for those of you listening, if you're listening uh, when this episode is live, we will have just been through uh, the solar eclipse new moon. Mm -hmm. So we're in this really interesting eclipse portal. And the eclipse portal asks us to look back at the last eclipse season, which happened to be October 2023, which was the exact date on the 14th that we started our YTT in Panama last year. So I thought that was wow. really interesting that we are like coming together to talk live um, and always kind of doing this work around eclipses. Mm. Yeah. It's powerful energy. Know. That's like your Any side, <laughs> yeah. and I just absorb it, and I'm like, yes, moons, everybody, but <laughs> I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I know, I know. I I I'll, I hold down sort of the witchier component of of uh, this duo, but Ashley holds down <laughs> basically basically everything else. Like, I don't know if I would have been able to like be a be in business um, with the district or Girlvana, and now our yoga teacher training um, without Ashley. So maybe we'll take people mm -hmm. first through our history. Ashley Brodeur is just a young girl with long blonde hair working at a Viva a Park Royal West Vancouver. <laughs> and that's the first time we met, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? Yeah, I would have been, oh my goodness, I would have been still in university. And my manager at the time told me about this training that was happening. You had little postcards that you dropped off, like Girl Vanna, Yoga for Teen Girls. And she said, I think you would like this because at that point I had been teaching yoga for a couple years and I really connected or wanted to start working a little bit more with like youth. So I signed up for your first ever Girl Vanna training, which was in the attic of Lulu Kits. Um, there was like, I don't even know how many of us, like eight, maybe. Yeah, like maybe six of them. Like one was yeah. my mom or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just remember feeling so connected to you and the work. And I think you have this memory too. I called my dad and... I guess we were doing dad calls back then too. Um, and I just remember thinking like, oh, I just love this work and I just want to do it. And I think I even told you that. I said, however you need help, let me know. I will be there. And I was there for like, yeah. I've been there. <laughs> you bet she has been there. Um, yeah. And then Ashley went to India um, not so long after that. And when you came back from India, you showed up at the studio and took a hip hop dance class. And I was like, oh, she's back. And I think I hired you, right, as a teacher. And, and really the rest is, is history. Um, and you came on to teach at the studio, you came to one of your first girl vanas, and I just thought, and I still think this way, let it be known that I, I just do not want to do this work, uh, without Ashley by my side for so many different reasons. And so for those of you that don't know Ash, um, what you can kind of get with Ashley is a few things, but the first is like this real genuine sense of play and like fun. Um, and you also really hold the kind of more structured, organized mind and things that I don't have. So we make great partners in that way. But so many people that have that kind of structured, organized brain don't have the same level of play. 
and fun that you do. It's like such, it's the most beautiful blend. And I feel so, so grateful to have that so close to all the things that we create together. But I'm curious, and we're going to get into how you then became a a psychotherapist and the incredible work that you do. Um, But why did you come to yoga? What was the first thing that kind of got you through the door of of a yoga studio? Mm. It was my mom. It was my mom and my aunt. And um, they, I don't even know why, who knows, like they could have just thought it was like the cool thing to do or a family bonding moment. But we went, I probably did my first yoga class with my mom and aunt when I was like 14. And then I started, I found like Bikram yoga, like back in the day. And I would drive when I got my license, I would drive for like an hour to the other side of Calgary to take like a 90 minute class in a carpeted room of someone yelling at you. Um, But that was my entry to yoga. And I, I am grateful for that because I think that's when I started to realize Um, connection to body and breath. And I don't think I ever understood really what they were saying at the time. I was so young. So I don't think I really grasped any of the concepts, but there was that feeling that I got at the end of class that I think just kept me um, going back. And I was at a time in my life when I was in university, I was living in Edmonton and I just, something felt off and I still don't think I knew the words, but I just knew something felt off and I was in a yoga class And I overheard someone talk about a Bikram teacher training Uh, and I applied but got rejected because I wasn't 21. I think I was 18 at the time. And someone then told me about moksha. So that was kind of how I started. And um, and then here I am now, I don't know, like 14 years later, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And and. I feel like back then you were maybe a little more shy. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Like really shy. What shifted? Like, how did you find your voice as a yoga teacher? Because you have such a strong voice as a teacher. Like when you're in the seat of the teacher, it just like pours through you. And I'm curious, like, was it yoga that taught you how to find your voice and like get you out of being like the shy Ash? Mm. Yes and no. I would actually say like you and Girl Vanna, which Mm. would have come, I would have been teaching yoga for four years before I started working with you. And when I graduated from my YTT, one, I didn't talk at all during my yoga teacher training. I think the people who took yoga teacher training with me would be like, who is, who was, she was there, she attended. (laughs) I think the I think the founders of Moksha would be like, I'm sorry, what is your name? Like I was very small. I was very shy. I think I cried most days at my yoga teacher training. I called my mom on the first day um, and said, I, I need to come home. Like this was a mistake. I can't do this. I can't be. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to say. I'm the youngest one here. And so to survive, I just adopted like which was my narrative for a while was like, be a good girl. And do you just like learn how to be good? And so I like memorized the script. I would just like mimic what I saw in a lot of other yoga teachers. And I got by doing that for four years, just kind of like mimicking and like doing the script and like doing the voice. I had a very nice voice. Um, And then I think it was like Girl Vanna and going on that first retreat in Cortez that I realized like there's a different way to teach yoga to be in your body. And so I know we joke and I know I've said it to you so many times, but I really think you had a part in like raising me of like who I am today because it was the first time I just witnessed a different representation of how you could be. So, hmm. yeah. Yoga and that, re- yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ash. I mean, yeah, now I think the roles are reversed where I'm like, Ash, they help. <laughs> um, but I think that retreat was such a intense retreat. And for context, we took like whatever, 10 teenage girls to Cortez Island, which like you have to take like five ferries to get there. And it was, you know, the kids were in the car. It was hardcore. Um, and we dealt with a lot of different elements as we do every girl van. There's always something different but this one was really unique um and 
but I think the what that work does really is it's so expressive. It's so messy. It's unlike a, you know, quiet yoga class where everyone does the moves and goes home. It's a lot of crying. It's a lot of laughter. It's a lot of dance. And I think there's this blend, which is really unique, I think, to both of our experiences growing up dancing and growing up being sort of in our bodies. But yoga allows us to find movement and expression in a different way but I think sometimes it gets too serious and so girl Vanna I think still whatever 15 years later gives us the permission to kind of like go back to that and be really silly and Ash has like a signature let's call it what we call it it's like not a dance but it's like a signature experience uh (laughs) that every now and again where the energy gets really heavy at a retreat and I'm like Ash time for the dance and we put on evanescence and ashley does like a full interpretive dance routine and she pours water all over herself and you have to be there to witness it and it's so funny and this is what i love about you is just like your ability to laugh at yourself or actually put yourself in a scenario that like allows you to be laughed at but in the most like (laughs) wholesome way for the sake of like breaking up some of the intensity and so um that is something you do so well and like I said it's something that I I feel so grateful to have around me um so you learn you discover your voice you you get more playful you become more you and then you start something called philosophy so philosophy and what's the genesis story of philosophy why is that work so important to you why did you start it yeah if i'm being super honest i started it because i was starting to feel burnt out teaching yoga and i wanted and you know me like i always have a business brain like i went to school for business so uh i inherited that from my mom so i think that my brain is always in that realm too. And so I was like, I want to start doing a workshop. And it was our good friend, Anita, who was the first person who suggested um, I do like a yoga massage class because I was known for my Shavasana adjustments. And so she helped me do the first ever kind of workshop together. It was yoga and massage. And from that, it just started to unfold. It was Gian who gave me the name. Um, I went to him and I said, this is my idea. It's about touch. It's about feels. Um, And he came, I think he went to the bathroom and he came back and he said, the philosophy. I made a website that night. I made an Instagram page and it was just birthed out of it. Probably there was like, um, if you've ever read like big magic, they just say like people are dropped down almost like I, oops, ideas. And (laughs) I just like listened and I trusted it. And often that happens a lot in my life where I'll just have almost like a download and I have no justification for why. And I just follow it. And in the very first class, there was a woman who came and she was a new mom and she emailed me right after. And she said, I didn't realize how much I needed this. She's like, I'm so touched out from being a mom, but I realized how much I crave this um, safe, supportive touch. And it was that email um, that I think started to shift it. And I started to then unpack for myself and do my own work around touch. What is my relationship to touch? Uh, What do I believe about touch? And I slowly just started to weave that more in. I started to study touch. um, And over the years, it's now evolved into where it is today, where I, I really advocate and teach people how to like hold space for touch. But Back then it was restorative yoga and just like lots of scalp massages. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so beautiful if anyone's ever had the blessing of being in one of those rooms with Ash. And I'm curious when you started to unpack your own relationship with touch, what showed up for you? Because this topic is so fascinating and I think um, we are so starved, so many of us from touch or non-sexual touch or safe touch or whether we got, you know, touch safely growing up or we didn't. Like it's a really, really nuanced topic. So I'm curious when you were in your own exploration of touch with around how you felt about touch and what you were bringing to people, like let's say in like the three first years of the philosophy, like what did you see most showing up in your classes and, and showing up in yourself with your own relationship to touch? 
The first thing often is like people will go into the memories of uh, ways in which they were touched that they didn't want touch. So that's often what came forward first for me was all these memories of like the way in which I was touched without my consent, the way in which I was um, sexually assaulted, the way in which touch was used um, as a method of control or power or just attention. Like in grade seven, I would want boys to like, like they would like spank your butt in the hallway. And that was like, you made it because he like spanked you. Like what the actual fuck is wrong with so many of that. Um, But it was like the way in which touch was used that wasn't like for me Mm. or um, we often call it like a touch currency where often our experience of touch is somebody might touch me, but they want something from me. So even if it's consensual, even if my partner, um, you know, is massaging my feet, he might want something from me. He wants my attention or he wants it to lead somewhere. And it's rare that we get touched just for the sake of supportive touch. It's like, Mm -hmm. I really felt that those spaces didn't exist. And so that's what I wanted to create with philosophy was like, you get to show up and you get to receive touch in this consensual space. And like, I don't want anything from you. Um, mm. Yeah, it's idea. so, yeah, it's so powerful. And I'm sure throughout that process, you saw a lot of, um, yeah, either emotional release or like these emails coming in and just people that probably have never, I mean, probably even people listening to this have, are, you know, starting to think about their relationship to touch. Like, have I ever been touched in a way that wasn't about some, getting someone getting something from me or needing something from me? Um, and I think a lot of this too is is uh, maybe a bit women specific or mother specific to a way that we feel about touch. Um, and so what led you then to become a psychotherapist? Like, are those two things intrinsically linked for you as you were teaching philosophy did it feel like there was another piece that was missing? Yeah, I often, I felt it most in like leading retreats. I would feel Mm -hmm. it most in leading retreats, sometimes girl Vanna, but sometimes like the adult retreats where I just felt that I was missing something in order to like fully hold space. I now know that like, I actually didn't need a master's for that. I don't actually believe that we need like these credentials or like other people or like systems to prove our worth. So, um, but I think for me at the time, I started to become a little bit more interested in like, how else could I do this work outside of like these yoga classes? Um, And that's what initially sparked me, I think, to do my master's. Um, But to be honest, I think I was back and forth between so many things and I was walking downtown Toronto, listening to like a true crime podcast of all things. And it was just that download that was like, yeah, just go back to school and move to a big city. <laughs> and so I yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Cause in that process, you moved from Vancouver to Toronto and met your now uh, partner, Kale. Kale, this is your official shout out on shout the podcast, uh, who is so lovely. And I love Kale. And we are going to your wedding this summer in Portugal. And we're very excited. Um, but so you go to school, you so you become a therapist, which is no small feat during the pandemic. Um, and now you have this incredible practice that blends all of this like amazing learning and understanding and wisdom of yoga and movement, touch, therapy, and then um, neuro effective touch, which you did this training in Los Angeles when I was living there. And, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about neuro effective touch and then how all of these avenues blend now into this like incredible body of work you offer the world. Yeah. And I think too, when you asked, did they blend together? When I went into my master's and I w- entered into the field of psychotherapy, it was during the pandemic, which was the time when we were told do not touch. And I completely mm. like let go um, of philosophy in the sense of the touch piece. I had kind of said, okay, that's no longer me. That was me. And I'm entering now into a field that also says, do not touch. Um, Mm. That has a lot of rules. And so I just kind of cut it out. And I said, yeah, I won't do that anymore. I will just be like a really good talk therapist. 
And I did that for the first two years of my career. I would, I just did talk. Um, and every once in a while I would bring it up with my supervisor. I would be like, I just feel like if I could hug this client or if I could help them like feel the support that they never got, that like there could be a lot of healing. And we were just talking about my past life and career and I brought up the touch aspect and she was the one who told me about neuroeffective touch. And she mm. said, there actually is a way that you can blend this. There is a way and, and her name is Dr. Aileen LaPierre and I think you should check her out. And I went on the website and I just signed up, I think that day. And we started last January, I started training with her. So again, it was just a download and I was like, here we go, dress. Yeah. And Dr. Aileen sounds like from what I gather, <laughs> seems like a total badass. So can you talk about sort of uh, her, her philosophy of, of what it, what it means to, to touch and talk? Yeah. Her belief was similar. Like she grew up, she's a little bit older and she grew up in the very like male dominated psychotherapy world. And a lot of common names, like you would see today, um, Peter Levine and, Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote like Body Keeps a Score. So she grew up and trained with a lot of those people as well. And her belief when she would work with a lot of clients was that in like early developmental ages, so uh, in even like when we're in the womb, but then also when we're babies and when we're growing up, touch is like a huge part of how we receive care. It's also how we interact with the world. It's how we interact mm. with safety and our caregivers. And as we get older, um, we start to either like not receive the care that we need or the attunement that we need, or maybe we never did. And so her belief is that like touch is actually a way that we can heal that kind of relational wound um, or that attachment based wound. And then it's developed from there. Touch is a way that you can support people learn to regulate their nervous system. Um, I've been working with it with people who've ever been like violated through touch and helping them to like rewrite their relationship to touch and feel safe in their body again. But yeah, her work is incredible. She's like so knowledgeable. I don't even think I can do her justice, but her huge belief is that attentive, attuned care um, is like profound. And it's the way that we connect mind and body because we tend to live mm. so separate and society um, prefers or sometimes prioritizes the mind. Like we're so mind-based and some, some somatic practices really prioritize the body. And I think neuroeffective touch, we really do both because I'm talking to you as we're working with your body. Um, mm. So a client comes to see you, uh, in Toronto and I guess you work with people in a multitude of ways. It could be online talk therapy, but if someone's coming to you, um, are you always offering this or is this something that like a client really needs to feel open to before you offer touch? Yeah, it's so slow and it's even slower than people realize because mm. a lot of people, you think you know what your body wants and you probably don't because a lot of us do not actually take the time to be slow and listen uh, even when I'm saying body, a lot of you might, your mind is probably only connected to like a certain part of your body yeah. because it's like, do you know what your like big toe needs? Probably not unless you've like ever. So it's very slow and I'm always getting consent from the mind and the body. Mm. And so sometimes like we do not touch at all. Sometimes we might never touch. Sometimes it's just the person offering touch. Um, so it can look mm. a variety of ways, but it's slow. Right. And then you do your breath work training. I mean, you, you are always amazing me with how much education you have. It's incredible. Um, as someone who has like zero, I'm just like, I just close my eyes and talk to God. And then I <laughs> learn things, uh, which is just a different way. Uh, I've learned to not, you know, uh, beat myself up about that. I think I had that realization in Panama last year where I was like, I think it's okay if I don't have as much education. And, you know, that was my own sort of healing. Um, but you do a breathwork training. Um, you, you go deep into your own breathwork practices. I, I know that and have witnessed that firsthand. But now as you as a facilitator opening up 
yet another sort of wing of the work you do to lead people through this sort of nonverbal processing of emotion. Uh, and I'm curious what that feels like for you as like another kind of feather in your cap of facilitation as a breathwork teacher. What's what's here for you um, or what sort of surprised you in breathwork facilitation? I think the biggest one is like how healing or supportive um, the release of breathwork can be mm. and how nobody or it's rare that people give themselves permission for that release. I think you talked about it in your last episode of like mm -hmm. that release of um, anger or rage or tears. Um, when we're so focused on the mind, people are so good at reasoning and logicking, logicking, that's a word for me, um, their way out of like actually feeling. So I'll be doing one-on-one -on -one therapy and people are just talking themselves out of crying. They're talking themselves out yeah. of anger. They're justifying and they're just all up in here. And breath work was so quick to just, it's like this permission slip almost of here's tears and I'm not going to tell you that they need to go anywhere and we're just going to hold it and you're going to cry. Or here's an opportunity to just like scream and the amount of people now like screaming with me on a weekly basis is so fun for them, for me mostly, because now I scream like on a weekly basis. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it just access and I think it's showing people there's more than one way to feel, to process, to access what we call therapy. It doesn't have yeah. to look like just sitting, staring at somebody and talking for an hour. Yeah. I love that. I love your view on this. And I use you as an example. Often I work with um, some clients one on one and uh, a few of them actually are therapists and and I'm working with them constantly to try to break down the walls of uh, their education and their schooling and the kind of red tape around therapy. And it could be so much more than just talk. And um, I actually have like a few yoga therapists blends of, of clients and I'm like, take it all, sit people in a room for 90 minutes and use all your tools together. And you'd be so amazed to see what goes down. And I just love that you're offering it in, in, in your own unique way, which is so Ashley, because you have this way of, even though you are so educated and are so smart, um, you offer it in the most real uh, way. And that's something I take a lot of pride in as people that are sort of in my circle, um, is that we're all just real ass bitches, you know, we're just like, Hey, <laughs> I learned a few things along the way. I'm going to offer it to you and have zero ego about it. And that is, um, is so you. And I was texting you yesterday. Uh, I had released the episode, the last week's episode. And, um, this man just sent me a DM being like, why are you so angry? <laughs> And I think it's so funny because you and I have been talking about this a lot. And I actually think this might be the theme of this entire podcast. I need to yeah. rename it. It's the rage show with Ali Maz. Um, but we had a conversation when we were in Mexico. Ash attended uh, Lady Vana in Mexico and um, just having more conversations because uh, about rage um, and, and being angry. And, you know, when that guy asked me, like, what are you so angry about? And I was like, you know, I don't, I can't pinpoint it. It's not one thing, but it's working with the righteous anger within ourselves. And so I think we started the conversation. I was like, who are you angry at? And you were like, I don't know, no one. And then like in 20 minutes, you had like a list of 12 people. And I was like, all right. You know, and I think that's true for all of us, people that are like, I'm not angry. And then if you really start to pull out, it's like, well, actually, wait a second, this, this, this. And it's not to say you need to go then pick up the phone and tell people that you're angry. It's finding ways to move it through your body. Breath work is one of them. Um, screaming, dancing, stomping your feet. Both you and I love the class. The class is such an amazing way to to move and, and process your anger. And so I'm curious, what is your relationship maybe since that conversation to, to anger now? Yeah, I think you said to me, how are you not angry? You're the person who says punch the ocean and scream and do all these things. Um, so like permission to identify anger, but also to understand, at least for me, that like anger is just an energy. Anger mm. is not, yeah, anger is an energy. And, and just like any other emotion, that's an energy. It deserves space to be processed. 
And so for me, it wasn't like, oh, here's my list of 12 people. And now I'm going to like call you up from 10 years ago. And I'm going to like sit you down, mom. Well, I actually did that one, but I'm going to like, I'm not going to go through because some of it was just like, I'm angry and I swallowed it and I didn't feel I had the, mm. the permission to release it. So I'm just going to release it. Um, and now for me, I think I'm a lot, I can identify it a lot quicker and I can almost like, I think you use the words like clean it up. I like clean it up a lot quicker. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's the energy of anger. Here's how I'm going to release it. And then once it's released, I can usually get to the bottom of like what need is unexpressed that I need to ask for. Where can I offer compassion? What like internal boundary did I actually cross? Therefore, they crossed it that I need to like just tidy up a little bit. It's mm. usually like never about the other person. I like rarely no. feel I need to go there. Same. Oh, I love how you just articulated that. And it's so true. If we can just meet it and not label it like for me, it was like, yeah, sad is maybe better than angry. Or, you know, we kind of have like these categories of our emotions. And for me, anger was like at the bottom. Like that's the one you don't touch. You don't feel like you said, you're not allowed to feel versus like maybe sad is like somehow nicer or cuter or frustrated versus the anger itself. So when we're actually neutral around the thing and just feeling it, and that's actually what I love about breath work is like, okay, big feelings come forward and you don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to name it or narrate it. It's just like, get it the fuck out of my body yeah. now. <clears throat> and I love what you said about boundaries. And can you actually talk a little bit more about boundaries? Cause I think, um, I've learned a lot. I know I've learned a lot about boundaries and certainly in work settings, but I'm curious, like your relationship to setting boundaries um, or how you, you work with your clients and them creating boundaries, especially for women, because I think it's so hard for us. Mm. I've learned so much about boundaries from like Adri, but mm. I think something that she had said to me once was most boundaries are energetic. So most boundaries actually start like internally and you, if someone's crossed your boundary, it's because you've crossed it first. And mm. so an example I often use is a boundary is almost, it's like a house and your boundaries are like your doors to your different rooms in your house. And so doors are always like, you can open them, you can close them. Um, you don't want everyone in your bedroom. Sometimes you just want people in your kitchen. Sometimes you want people like outside of the house. Um, so boundaries, they can be verbal things that you say, like, do not do this, or please don't, you know, like they can be requests, but often boundaries are like things that you uphold and like, you are the only one who can control your boundary. Like I can't control what you do. Um, so I can never have a boundary that's specific, like Alex, don't text me past 8 PM. That wouldn't be a boundary. The boundary would be, I don't check my phone past 8 PM. So like mm. you can text me as much as you want. I have no control over you, but I can control me. Um, yes. I love that. Yeah. That's a really good reframe. Cause I often think uh, I have thought about boundaries the other way. Like, don't do that. <laughs> and it's like, well, I can't control what you do or not, but I am not going to be available for, or um, yeah, where you kind of, shift the paradigm. And then I think it's easier to declare that because I think sometimes with boundaries, for me anyways, they feel more, com I have thought of them as more confrontational or that I have to like be like not myself to create them. But I, I thank you for that little reframe. That really helped me actually <laughs> a lot as you often do. Um, <laughs> You work a lot with teens uh, in a therapeutic sense. Um, I mean, you always have, but um, you work with teenagers as a part of your practice. And, um, you know, we know this because we work with teens. There's so much narrative around like, ah, geez, teens today, like, you know, social media, Gen Z, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is maybe a twofold question and you can answer it however you like, but um, what's sort of, sort of your thought around working? What do teens these days need? Um, and what did their parents need to hear? <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to start with that one because okay. not a hundred percent of the time, like, n but often I feel that first of all, just acknowledging like parents are humans and parents are people. And as a human to a human, I can understand and I have so much compassion for parents. I have so much compassion for 
what they're doing and I can see like the multiples that they're having to hold and juggle, your teenager cannot see that, nor should you expect them to see that Hmm. from just a very like physiological level, that part of their brain isn't even developed. The part that has like rational and reasoning and imagination and creativity and it's just not fully on yet. So they don't understand that like you may be stressed about like finances while also caretaking for your own parent while also navigating how you feel about your husband. They don't know that. And so all they see is like you are their primary caregiver you are the person that goes that they have to go to for like most of their needs to be met. And so often what happens is when teenagers are acting out or not behaving like how the parent wants, they'll put the teen in therapy. Um, and I do think it's like really wonderful for teens to have a safe space because often they're going to share with me things they don't want to share with their parents. Yeah. But a lot of the times I think like the parent could also benefit from the therapy I think anyone can benefit from therapy, but I really think all teens need to know is that like whatever they're feeling is like so valid. Even if you disagree with it, like teens will tell me things and I'm like, okay, I like don't really agree with that, but I can validate that it's frustrating for you. I can validate that it's really hard. Um, A lot of teens come to me and they have these dreams and they don't know reality yet. So they have these like beautiful dreams and it's like, just like believe in their dream because who knows who's like you as a parent might have this reality, like it's hard and, but like your teen doesn't know that yet. So like let them dream and hold space for that dream because the minute you shut down their dream, they're not going to come to you anymore. Like they have an idea. They're not going to come to you. Um, Mm. You don't believe in them or you don't believe Mm. them. They're not going to come to you. So, but it's hard. And that's why I think like parents should also have their own therapist because yeah, it's so hard. Yeah. Oh, I wish every parent in the world could just hear what you just said. And it's so true. And we have seen this over, you know, 15 years of this work. It's like, what's wrong with my kid? You know, there's something wrong with them. I'm like, if you view your kid as, as wrong and bad, there's nowhere for that kid to go. It's like they, mm-hmm. they, and, um, and so much of it is like pointing the finger at what is wrong with them and never looking at themselves as a parent. I'm like, you, what's wrong with them? You, uh, not always, but, but sometimes it's like, it's, it's time to look within and, um, and gosh, I have so much compassion, um, having spent all this time with teenagers for parents. And it gives me so much more compassion for my own mother. And I've been talking about this a lot because it's been feeling like a really big realization where I am so grateful for my parents Mm -hmm. because I did have parents that I was like, I'm going to do that. And they were just like, sure, honey, that's great. Good for you. (laughs) But it did keep the door open, you know, because I felt Mm -hmm. like they believed me um, and believed in me. Um, And I think that's so, so key. And seeing what you have seen through your practice uh, and seeing how challenging it can be for parents to parent teenagers and I think I know this for sure is that you, you want to be a mom. And so I'm curious how you (laughs) reconcile that, (laughs) you know, and I'm sort of in the same boat. I'm like, damn, that looks crazy, but I'm like, okay, sure. Um, and I'm curious like what that, what that is like for you when you're with all these sort of sensitive young people and then you're like, okay, I'm going to raise, raise one of these one day. Yeah. Delusion. Um, (laughs) that's what I pull on. I think this thing called, like it's just radical trust and it's radical because there's nothing you can do except trust. And I practice radical trust with my teens and no matter, like I hear some heavy stuff and, but I still have this trust that like they will be okay and they are okay. And, um, and so I think I just have this radical trust that like it will be whatever it will be when I have a kid and I trust that like, even when it's really hard and I know it's going to be probably so hard that like we make it through. I witness, even though I witness everyone's really hard shit, what I also witness is like people making it through and like people surviving despite it being hard. And so I sometimes don't worry too much about the hard stuff that I'm hearing. I try to pick up more on it's really hard. And these are all the things that you're doing. 
Like yeah. I have one client who's like gone through, I think the hardest things that no one should ever have to go through like four times over. Mm. And I don't really focus so much on that. I focus on like how they're getting through and the people who are showing up for them and like the insanely loving parents that this person has showing up for them. And I'm like, that is what I want to focus on instead of the what ifs. Yeah. And you're so good at being in the present moment, I think with these things too. And that is such medicine for everyone. It's like, okay, these things happened and you're here right now. You've survived every day of your life and you're here right now and in this moment. And that is worth everything. Um, and I think so much of the work that you do and that we do is, is, is bringing people back to what is here Mm -hmm. now and okay. The, maybe the event the traumatic event is over, but the, the feeling is here and it's in the body. And then how do we work with the body? How do we work with touch? How do we work with talk? How do we work with dance? How do we work with our scream? How do we work with our breath, um, to continue taking steps forward? And, um, you know, my teacher always says like, what time is it now? And Ash and I've been joking about, which I think we should get this, this tattoo on our, our left wrist that just says now. So every time you want to check the time, you can remember that the time is now. And that has certainly um, helped me. And, and you can hold people and myself included as your friend and business partner in a really neutral way, which not everyone can do. And neutrality is, is the greatest gift. And I think parents, it's really hard for parents to hold their children in neutrality because it's so easy to react. Um, but to just be neutral when someone shares something, it's like, I can even just see you're just like you have a you just do the head nod (laughs) you know and you receive without reacting and being afraid or jumping all over it or trying to fix it or trying to cure it is like the the medicine and in being neutrally held to say what you need to say without reactivity is I think is what you that's your job right that's just what you do all day (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I'm sure you're challenged with neutrality in times where it gets underneath you, like when Matthew Perry from actor from Friends died. Okay, that was (laughs) devastating, everybody. Okay, it was devastating, but. Ashley and I have this joke where right? sometimes actually this is a good segue because sometimes you're so neutral where I'm like is she a sociopath like <laughs> you know like we go to bed at, at night at teacher training and she's just like good night and just like closes her little angel eyes and sleeps like a literal angel doesn't move doesn't make a sound she's uh, like this is the most uh, profound superpower I think because I'm not a great sleeper you just go good night close your eyes and is asleep for the whole night and I was like, I don't know, something's weird here. <laughs> Yoga teacher training is so heavy and, you know, we're dealing with a lot of stuff and people's emotions and, you know, fears and whatever. And so I'm like, gosh, nothing gets her. And then Matthew Perry uh, of Friends, <laughs> tragically trying, not laughing about that. And Ash just, poof, just broke open. That's what got her. Matthew Perry. That's what got me. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So she is, has feelings, people, but it just comes to her differently. Yes. Yeah. I think somebody asked me this yesterday because, um, I hold space like in my work as a therapist. And then once a week, I also teach yoga and I do the transition like really quickly. And Mm -hmm. they're like, don't you get impacted? And I think same, we talk about it like YTT, especially around integration. And I think, um, I have such a way that I can really, I care, but I don't carry And so Mm -hmm. I care, Mm -hmm. but I don't carry it with me. Like I go home and I just like, I just, because I can't, because if I carried it, I don't think I could function and I don't think I could show up. So I have this almost practice that I want to say, girl, Vanna boundary shield. Like I am, you are. I don't know if you remember that. I think Jess. I do, but I somehow still this lesson just can't, it's taking me a little longer than you. And so I'm just like, I can't, like, I bring people close, but then I I right away, I'm able to really like move it. And, um, but I think, and you know this, and I have this like really soft spot for like dads and anything that reminds me of like my dad and Matthew Perry just brought up so many memories for me of my childhood and watching friends with my mom and dad. So it wasn't like Matthew Perry specifically, even though like, (laughs) of course, of course. It was like my my like core 
soft <laughs> spot, which is like my my mom and my dad. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. No, it's so sweet. I hope the listeners know we're just poking fun. We're just having a laugh about Matthew Perry. Well, not at his, at his expense, but what it brought forward. I was like, okay, here she is. She's got, yeah. she's she's sad, finally. Because I'm just a bleeding heart leaking my energy mm-hmm. all over the fucking world. You know this. And I become better, but I'm certainly, oof. It's like the most challenging thing for me is, is to not, because I think I care mm-hmm. and carry more than I yeah. I should, uh, but we're working on it. Um, and that's why I love being around you because it's so nice to have someone that is really regulated. Um, Ashley has a very regulated nervous system. And so it's a pleasure to be around. And I think people can understand the difference when you're with someone who's really dysregulated, how stressful it can feel. And then someone who's in their body and slow and is breathing. It's like, oh, it's such that in itself is a gift. Your presence is the gift. Um, and so when we are on yoga teacher trainings together, um, so we have one coming up. It's it's happening uh, the last two weeks of October in Panama at Sansara. This is something we created together in 2017. Uh, it's for anyone who wants to become a yoga teacher or anyone that wants to learn about yoga, because I think that's the common misconception. And we get these DMs being like, I don't know if I'm ready. I've only been doing yoga for like two years. I'm like, that's fine. Come learn and deepen um, and understand the practice. You cannot get that learning just from going to class. I think everyone that loves yoga should do a training, uh, whether you want to teach or not. But I'm interested in, because in the time that we've been doing this, you became a therapist and, you know, your work has so expanded. And I think you had really cool learnings last year about Mm -hmm. how therapy and yoga philosophy are sort of in this kind of beautiful marriage. So I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think this realization and and sometimes um, I think it's it's all like same knowledge source, like if we just think like universal knowledge. And we've just distilled it into like different ways for people to absorb it. And so a lot of the teachings in therapy, which also I'll name are westernized. So like most likely stolen anyway from like other cultures. But let it be known. Yeah. (laughs) Let it be known. A lot of a lot of like uh, therapy ideas are so actually closely aligned with yoga ideas. philosophy as well. I think you would lead a lecture on like samskaras and kind of the train tracks of like the beliefs. And then I'm just going into like core beliefs, which we work with all the time. And so they, they wove together so beautifully. And I also think what I witness in so many in myself, I witnessed it, but in so many other people is being a yoga teacher is so vulnerable. You are in front of strangers and you're being witnessed and that takes a lot to like step into that and i think we need almost like this ability to like do you know how to regulate your nervous system do you know your own mm-hmm. shit do you know how to work through um what's coming up for you when you're interacting with these other humans do you know how to not take things personally do you know how to not have like personal bias around certain students like that is information that i don't think we ever taught until I became a therapist. It was more like, here's how to teach a really strong class, which we still do, but it's almost like, here's how to just exist in your life, like in a powerful yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Here's how to be a human 101, I think is really what our, our YTT is all about. And uh, whether you're coming because you like, I mean, do, especially in this last training, had a few really strong ones that want to be like career yoga teachers, which is amazing in the path that we've both been on. Um, but a lot of people come because it, it supports the work that they're doing as a death doula or work that they're doing as therapists or work that they're doing as as parents. Um, I just see it, it it coming into all facets of life. And so Ash and I are there with you in Panama. And then we have a, a, an amazing digital component to the training um, with this wonderful woman, Naya of Soul and um, viewing yoga and this work from an anti-oppression lens. And so I think that's a blend too that is is so important in this training is, is like we're getting not just, you know, touch your toes, downward dog, but you're looking at the full scope of, of how to be a human uh, in the world. And I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit more about Naya's work and Tessa's work. Yeah. 
I think um, it's so like the work and that piece too is this realization of like yoga at its like roots is so beautiful, but when it shows up in this like Western capitalistic world, I think it a lot of it got lost. And so what Naya um, comes in and does with her work is she, I think she just like shines a flashlight on areas that we might be blind to. And yeah. not just as like yoga teachers, but I think just as like humans in general, she just does this beautiful job of, of yeah, shining, mirroring, um, I heard, I don't know if it was her who said it, but someone said like, what if when we, we talk a little bit about education, you're like, I didn't go to school, but I think what you've done so beautifully is like, you are the subject and like, you have just studied you. And did you say this mm -hmm. actually? I no, this, this is cool quote. though. I wish, I wish I did. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, somebody said, and like, you're like, that was me. Um, but like, I think we, most people assume that, oh, I can only do a training if it's like specific to what I want to do. I only have to go back to school if that's the career I want. But like you are the subject of your life. Like wouldn't you want to like just study and get to know you a little bit more in advance and like learn as much as you, you could about you? And I think like that's what our yoga teacher training does. But I think that's what Naya does too so beautifully is she's like, let's learn about these like darker parts that we've all been pretending don't exist. Let's talk mm. about the bias that I know you all have. Let's talk about the prejudice, not from like a judgmental way, like shame on you, but from a way that goes, wouldn't it be great if you just knew this about yourself so that you could yeah. shift it and then like what you could offer? Yeah. Naya is one of the most amazing facilitators I've ever come across. And I really mean that. And I told her that I was just like, damn, it's yeah, I just love her facilitation style. And I think it's such a beautiful component, um, mm -hmm. sort of before and after we come into the the deep container of the in person work to, to meet and come together online like that is, mm -hmm. is so cool. Um, and so if you're if anyone is curious, feel free to DM myself or Ash, it's just feel f e e l v a n a dot com which if you now maybe the the wheels are turning now that is <laughs> philosophy and girl band coming together um but that's the one time a year ash and i come together and, and do work with, together which is so lovely um and so before we close <laughs> i wanted to touch a little bit on um your personal life <laughs> as someone who is, uh, yeah, getting married and has such a wonderful partner. I mean, you've done so much work on yourself, kind of what we're talking about, this sort of examined life. Um, how does it feel to, you know, step into partnership and, and to come into, I mean, there was a time you and I in our like twenties were like, oh, why would anyone ever get married? Like, that's so dumb, you know, and then like here we both are. So I'm just curious of like, what, what is going on within you as you kind of embark in this like next chapter and in, in, in deep partnership with a really wonderful human? Hmm. Wow. I think just like a lot of trust too, just trust. Um, I think, yeah, I honestly haven't thought about this, which I probably should have, seeming that we're like legally getting married, like on the 17th of April, we're like signing the papers, <laughs> like no going back. There's just like, I think it's so beautiful to have somebody like witness your life next to you and like you be able to witness life with them. And that's just like what Kale has been for me. I think we're very different and we're very similar. And um, I actually found when I went home, I was reading my own, my old journals. And when I was in India, I wrote a letter of all the things that I wanted in a future partner. And I like crumpled it up and I threw it out the bus window, like literary, but I, but I like threw it out and I was like, take this universe. And I quickly wrote down all the things that I said because I was like, I do one day want to come back to it. Mm. And I read it out loud and it is kale to a T minus the fact that he doesn't want to take me sailing. Like he doesn't like boats and water, but um, every, and it's a three page front and back list of just qualities. It had nothing to do with like appearances, job, like all those stupid things that we get caught up mm -hmm. in. It was just like, qualities, core feelings. Um, 
And so I think it's pretty cool that that's happening now. <laughs> I love that. If you are single and want a partner, like like just turn this podcast off immediately and go and write this list I just when people are like how do you find someone I'm like not by looking outside of yourself it's about looking within yourself and figuring out what you really want and I could say the exact same thing about Bill Mm -hmm. I wrote him down on a piece of paper one day and you know he came in the most uh, you know like unassuming package um and that deep commitment to like exactly the core feelings, not about what they look like or what they wear or whatever. Um, so I, I love that. I think there are the single people out there. Yeah. Write it down. And that's true about all things, about our dreams, about our life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, journaling and, and writing down a manifestation is a big proponent of, of both of our lives. So I, I love that. And it kind of is the same sort of question when I talk about, you know, motherhood, this idea when you're always working with teens, I'm sure you're always working with people who are in relationship and hearing all of the challenges of, of relationship. And I'm curious how your job and hearing like this is with therapists or maybe teachers or coaches, uh, you have this like insight into so many people's lives. This is, I think, you know, if you have a desk job or you're doing something else, you maybe don't have as much insight as we do into people's lives. What does it, like, how does it impact the way you live your life? So much compassion for everybody mm. because you really have no idea what they're going on going on behind closed doors mm. or even just, like, up in their own mind. So much acceptance for how people choose to show up and be in the world because, yeah, like, you can do, I, I talk to people every day that are living life in so many different ways and one is not better or worse or good or bad. So I think I just have so much acceptance of like, yeah, okay. Or, um, also this ability to probably pause and not get reactive. And I'm just like super curious in my own life about, well, why do I think that? Or why do I believe that? And like, do I need to believe that? Because, I talked to someone today who actually like challenges that thought. So maybe I could challenge it too. So it's just made me like really curious. Um, And life is also just like so short. And I think Mm -hmm. sometimes we get caught up in things that we maybe like don't have to. So I think I've realized that like I have so much gratitude for my friends, my family, my partner, like Kale just jokes. He's like, you just tell me all the things your clients like, husbands do wrongs like as a coded way so that I don't do them I'm like, kind of I'm like yeah and then the client's husband did this can you believe it and he's like noted I will never do that yeah. um, so just like gratitude yeah mm-hmm. I love that and like there is no right or wrong way to do life and I think when we suspend our own judgment and even our own belief system that's something I've been really like rocking with lately I'm like what if I had no beliefs like other than the belief in myself um but just didn't believe anything and just showed up with like a true I think this is what the Buddhists were talking about with beginner's mind like just a true neutral mind where you're just like huh never thought about it like that you know and we see what happens to a world we see we're living it in in so much division so much division is like right wrong good bad you're on a side and you stick by and you ride for that quote-unquote side when we're missing the point and, and back and forth and you can put that context on everything right now um but what if we uh suspended yeah our judgment and our our beliefs and and kind of showed up each day empty and just see what life had in store for us and it's it's kind of a really interesting edge of life to live on but i think that's the edge of life you live on constantly because if you were judgmental if you showed up to your sessions judgmental with a strong belief system people wouldn't get anything from that they wouldn't be able to trust you they wouldn't be able to learn or grow or process uh so i think it's such a beautiful way that even if you're not a therapist out there but just a way to sort of uh, another lens to look at life it's like it is not so black and white It is not so right or wrong, but it's just life is in the gray area, which you see every single day. Um, How do you, uh, what do you do for fun? (laughs) Because I'm sure your life does get heavy, you know, with this work sometimes. So so what what are you up to these days? What do you do for fun? Mm, I think I'm working too much. So because it's not coming forward as clearly as I would like it to. Um, (laughs) If I'm being honest, 
Yeah, like definitely right. travel. I've always been a, yeah. a travel gal. Like, if yeah, I love that. But on a day to day, what do I do for fun? I love to cook. I just when I was a little girl, I used to have my like pretend cooking show. Um, I would just talk to myself and cook and like mm-hmm. teach pe- teach people teach the wall um, mm-hmm. how to make. So I every day after work, I always cook. Like it's my it's my joy. So I think I do that mm-hmm. for fun and yoga is fun. So I do yoga. <laughs> Still. That was so that was so convincing. <laughs> no, I mean I know that you have fall. You know you talk about this where you sort of fall in and out with yoga, and I think every yoga teacher feels this way. I did like ten minutes of yoga today, and I was like okay yoga like wow I feel so good why have I been not doing this for the last two weeks but um yeah I think sometimes when we return to the mat after a while you're just like wow this feels good oh yeah so good like yoga retreat was I was like this is amazing (laughs) like yo like yeah so get a hold of yoga people yeah I know yeah it was I I say this to you a lot, but, uh, in the, in the five years we, so my former business partner, Gianna and I, there's an episode, you guys can listen to it, but we used to own a yoga studio. Ashley was a very, very big, uh, part of that. And we used to throw these really wild parties and these amazing classes. And I just have never nothing. I don't know, maybe till we open the hotel, we can start to recreate some community like this, but I'm like, God, I would like trade something very valuable just to like live one of those yoga classes again or like go back to one of those parties and like have that have that energy again where we were just wild and free mm-hmm. so free yeah. we were so, so free, free. We just yeah <laughs> like well but in a lot of ways I, I didn't feel free I was like mm-hmm. 26 like owning two businesses and so stressed and like couldn't pay my rent and felt like the world caving in on me so there was that too. And I was on the plane, wherever the last plane that I was on. And I always write all these notes in my phone. Like when I'm on the plane, that's my, my, my kind of ritual. I'll like write a little journal entry and then I'll go back and I can scroll back for like to like 2016. And I was thinking like, you know, I opened the studio, I had this awful home invasion. I like Mm -hmm. just went through a lot of stuff and I was like, huh, that, that was traumatic. Like I went through a lot of trauma in that time and so much pressure. And I was really like kind of, so I wrote a little letter to like that version of me, like the district version of me that was holding so much. I mean, talk about carrying, I was carrying it, all of it. And I was like, Hey, you like, man, it was so healing to do that, to go back and just like acknowledge that one. That was like, you know, I was young. And so, and we had such like fun times, but there was so much, in that time that I think I wasn't acknowledging. So there's always, if you think you're done the work, it's never done. (laughs) There is always a version of you that you need to look at and sort of validate. And um, Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I was like, oh, are you okay? 26, 27 year old me. Yeah. Yeah, She's fine now. Yeah. She's, she's fine now. She's thriving. 10 years later. (laughs) Well, Ashley, Noel, Brodeur, are you going to change your last name? No. Yeah. Don't do it. I did it and I regretted it. So we have kids. Yeah. I'm going to hyphenate when we have kids just for like travel purposes. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. When I, one time I asked Kale for your address and he just wrote, what's Kale's last name? Richardson? Richardson. Yeah. Richard. And he wrote Ashley Richardson. (laughs) And I was like, I don't think yeah. not. that's the route she's going to go down. No. Um, no. No. Not uh, no. Uh, if people want to work with you, if they're listening to this and they live in Toronto and they, they want to be touched by your gifts mm. in more ways than one, um, how do they find you? Yeah, I feel just like Instagram, at, I like at the dot philosophy or even my website, just the philosophy.com. You can see like all the all the stuff that we're up to and just, yeah send me a little yeah. email great uh and you are accepted do you accept and you're so busy i don't know do you have room for clients no but I will okay make room i will always make okay. room yeah like don't let okay. it be a deterrent people yeah. flow people come and go yeah um, okay 
if okay. I cross my own boundary, that's my work. So <laughs> that's right. That's her. Uh, that's on her. Um, and then if you're interested in, in teacher training, the applications are open. We have a really beautiful group um, coming together. And if you have any questions too, always feel free to reach out because um, there's lots of ways to, to make it work. And so if you're kind of on the fence, it's always nice to just ask us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love you dearly, nearly and dearly. Um, I said this when we were in Mexico, but I just, uh, yeah, I love you in every single lifetime. And I, I really believe that our souls continue to come together to kind of climb these massive mountains together. And when I look back sort of at our, our history and the things that we've been able to create together, um, it's just been amazing. And I, uh, so I just want it to be publicly known, even though I think, and I hope that you know this, that I wouldn't be like half the woman I am today without you being by my side. And I just have so much deep, deep respect and, and reverence in the ways that you've been able to stand beside me and or walk in front of me leading the way or just sort of gently encourage me from behind. But to me in life is like, yeah, there is no adulthood without Ashley, Noel, Broder, oh, Richardson. <laughs> oh, thank you. I won't cry, but if Matthew Perry's brought If she up, could, I yeah. If yeah. I could, I yeah, sorry. You guys know that's not enough to get the tears yeah. falling, but, you know, I tried, really tried, but it was just to prove a point. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. I love you too. I love you. All right, all. Thank you so much for listening. And if you liked this episode, you can like and subscribe and share a review because those mean a lot to me. And I just appreciate so much um, your comments and your DMs and the way that you're enjoying this podcast. And so, yeah, feel free to, to reach out. And Ash, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Bye.